Hey, you! Oi! Do you like math e magics? Well, champ, what if it was fun? Try this, you little scamp. Introducing Data Man, the only calculator that is fun. Why well, learn math from a weenie like your teacher, Mrs. Smith, when you can learn about it from a sentient robot who flies through space to protect the universe from an evil wizard called Anti Math? <clears throat> Ugh, my voice can't handle much more of that. I found this funky looking Texas Instruments educational calculator in a thrift store last year that was originally released in 1977. Even though mine was missing the battery cover, it came with a vintage battery attached with just as vintage corrosion. Released in early June of that year, it retailed for $22.95. If we put our trust in online inflation calculators, that's the equivalent of about $100 US in today's money. Texas Instruments sold it right through until 1981, where by then, it reportedly sold for only $16, or about 70 bucks. Mine's from 1980, and interestingly enough, was manufactured in El Salvador. That's a bit different. Quick side note, there are a few television commercials for the Data Man floating around online. They share a few different calculators in the ad released at the same time, including the TI-30. Advertised for the older sibling in high school, so they can digitally calculate algebra and stuff. It just so happens that I also own this, as it was my mum's when she was in high school. Go figure, the advertising works. Although I'm mostly mentioning this because I once posted it on Twitter, and none other than Clint from LGR retweeted it when I added him. I've been waiting five years to somehow show that off in a video. Anyway, the Data Man is a calculator with a backstory. And no, not some fun tidbits about its development. Someone at TI actually wrote lore for this thing. Data Man is a robot who whizzes around space, who, quote, has a brain of a computer and a heart of a friend. Aww. He was created by Commander Number Fun, who was a wise ruler of a faraway planet. He taught Data Man the secrets of an advanced people, and sent him on a journey through space to teach the wonders of numbers to all. This epic of course needs an antagonist too, and that role falls to Antimath, an evil wizard from a dark star who has the mysterious power to cloud the victims of its minds and steal away the fun and excitement of mathematics. Glorious. Long story short, Antimath has set his sights on Earth, and it's Data Man's mission to instill the fun of math to stupid Earthlings before it's too late. And here he is. Hmm. Considering my unit is over 40 years old, I think it's looking pretty good aside from the missing battery cover and corrosion on the 9 volt connector. Having said that, it still turns on and appears to be fully functioning. Before we get too deep into the weeds however, let's perform a bit of house cleaning. Even though it's not hampering its ability to connect to a battery, there's no such thing as good corrosion, especially when it's so easy to remove. Many videos will say to use IPA, but trust me, distilled white vinegar is way better for battery corrosion. You'll do with it no worries mate. How about what appears to be sticker residue on the screen though? Well, not so much. IPA and a paper towel instead make short work of that. But what about the missing battery cover? I doubt you can buy a replacement online, so I had to 3D print one. Because of course I had to, I'm one of those YouTubers now. I designed it with the help of high resolution photos I found online, as well as the dimensions of the battery compartment. I also scale ruled a few bits in, which worked out surprisingly well. Once I was happy with a basic design that would at least get me started, I modelled the cover using a mix of Tinkercad and FreeCAD. The print only took about half an hour using PLA, which is convenient, because like most first revisions, it didn't quite fit. Close, but some aspects were too short, while others were too long. Fast forward 5 or 6 revisions later, and we have a functional lid. Black doesn't fit the aesthetics though, let's see if we can address that. Here are some paints I found that might suit the colour of the data man a bit better. And here's the most fun part, a spray can of primer. I decided to test this in the paints on one of my failed prints. And note, don't spray it while simply holding it like a dork. This stuff is primo and is difficult to wash off skin. 
I'll work on that for the actual print we're going to use, but for now, let's test the three paints I have to see what matches the best. Out of the three, titanium silver is definitely a no-go, although I don't think I mixed it properly. Regardless, while flat aluminium and chrome silver look very similar on video, chrome silver matched the more textured parts of the mold, while flat aluminium resembled the smoother looking sections. According to my reference photos, the battery cover was the smoother style, so flat aluminium wins. So, with that, I primed up that finalised print, but this time by spraying it on a cardboard box while wearing a glove. It feels good to problem solve and overcome challenges. While the primer colour is fairly close itself, I ended up applying three coats of flat aluminium. Unfortunately, my limited painting skills resulted in a streaky appearance. That does suck, but it's good enough for now and better than straight up black. Regardless, I am prouder of the design and finished print than the painting. You can find the model on Thingiverse if you're one of the three people in the world who might need one. The link can be found in the description. Okay, enough of my new hobby. Back to Data Man. Ironically, it can't be used as a normal calculator. Instead, it features a selection of games and problem solving software aimed to help primary and elementary level students. Like all great 70s calculators, it features an 8 digit vacuum fluorescent display. While there is no sound, it does feature basic characteristics of a computer like temporary memory and a timer. Although the latter seems rudimentary since the manual states that the speed of the clock can be influenced by variables such as how fresh the battery is and the room temperature. It also can't compute negative numbers or show decimals. Division problems, for example, will instead show the whole number and the letter R to denote a remainder if necessary. Having said that, the games are surprisingly well designed considering the limitations. When you first turn it on, it defaults to the answer checker mode. Here, users can input a problem and attempt to get it right. An example will be typing in 2 plus 2 equals 4. Since that's correct, you'll receive a VFD enabled animation called a light show as a reward. If you type something wrong, for example typing 9 times 9 equals 82 like a complete dunce, EEE -E -E will display. Get it wrong twice, and the calculator will finally show the correct answer, making me wonder why there wasn't room for a basic calculator mode too. It's here you can also store problem problems, using the memory bank to try again later, although they will only last as long as the data man is switched on. At least, in my unit anyway. Its age could mean that any sort of memory might not be operational, but its age also makes non-volatile memory unlikely in the first place. The rest of the games are accessed by purposeful buttons just above the numbers. The first is Electro Flash, with the idea behind the name being flashcards for math tables. This one is electric. Get it? Here, you can choose any table from 0 to 9 for addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. You will be timed as you go and given a score at the end, plus another light show. Next, there's Number Guesser. The name explains the mode well. The data man will choose a random number between 9 and 100 and rate you on how quickly you guess it, gradually hinting at the number as you get closer. This is surprisingly fun and according to the manual, helps build skills in estimation and averaging. I could do with those skills. See? Learning is fun! Just to the left of the number guesser is Wipeout. Designed for two or more players and described as a hot potato math game, the goal is to correctly answer rapid fire math problems, passing from person to person until the device wipes out by showing a light show. The time it takes to wipe out is determined by the data man but not known to the players. When it wipes out, whoever holding it at the time is out. The idea is to keep going until only one player is left standing, but there's no way to input the number of players when you begin, so it just goes on forever otherwise. Force Out is also a multiplayer only game. The object is to keep subtracting from a given number until it hits zero, with whoever gets stuck on zero losing. You can only choose from 1 to 9 as the subtraction value, but I can imagine anyone playing this will just spam 9 and hope it quickly gets their opponent to zero. Lastly, there's a missing number game shown as a question mark in brackets. The user can choose from either addition, subtraction, multiplication or division problems and whether they want to answer the left, right or middle of the problem. There's also an advanced mode with harder problems that can be accessed by pressing the number 2. The data man will then throw out 10 problems while timing you, giving you 2 tries of each, which will determine your score and how awesome of a light show you get. While that's all the purpose made modes you'll get, the instruction manual includes many alternative games based on those modes using game cards and boards that originally came with the console. I don't own any of that to show you here, but I'm sure you get the idea. Alright, let's pull this thing apart. I'm interested to know what makes a basic novelty handheld computer from 1977 tick. What stands out immediately is that two of the four screws are missing, usually indicating that someone has been in here before. 
This would be worrying if it wasn't for the fact that it is functional. Separating the two halves of the case reveal a very simple layout. The plastic keys are held over the membrane by posts, but otherwise everything is in one module. There aren't many components at all really. Besides from the membrane, the display and a handful of capacitors, it looks like everything is driven by a single chip. Manufactured by TI naturally, the TMC1982NL has a difficult spec sheet to get a hold of. I had no luck in the Googles or even directly on TI's website. It does appear to be easy to purchase however. I saw a few listings on eBay if you need to repair one. Regardless, it would have been nice to learn extra information about its CPU speed, RAM and timing abilities. And it does appear that someone else has been working on this. It's obvious that a few solder joints have been reflowed. It would have been nice if they remembered to put all the screws back in though. So there you have it, the Texas Instruments Data Man from 1977. Honestly, I was surprised by the number of features it included considering the vintage. No way was I expecting aspects like the ability to store values and be timed. Vacuum fluorescent displays will always win brownie points with me too, no matter the application. So all in all, I'm impressed Texas Instruments. Even though my childhood didn't start for another 20 years after Data Man's release, I would have enjoyed this even in the 90s. It feels ahead of its time, considering the microcomputer boom was still in its infancy during the late 70s. Anyway, that's all I can possibly say about the Data Man. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to catch you in the next one. Bye!